Okay, number three on our list of essential biodiversity variables is community composition. Now I want you to remember that this is in some senses not at all independent of the species populations EBV. Because you remember that species populations EBV had a version that was numbers of individuals and it had a version of probability of occurrence of the species yes versus no. Well, if you know for every species on Earth and for every place on Earth the probability of occurrence, then you can create a picture of community composition, right? So in a sense, these are not independent. And I wonder if the species population EBV didn't do a little bit of kind of mission creep and, and extending out into distribution present or absent after it was defined. I don't know. But here we're essentially talking about do we know or can we know for any point or region on Earth the set of species that are present there. And this maps onto all sorts of neat questions of community ecology and, and things like that, biogeography. So let's just explore a little bit. One of the places where, where we have some of the very best data are with global fisheries. Okay, why do we have good data for global fisheries? Money, okay. So here's a, a paper, Rebuilding Global Fisheries. I'll just read a bit of the abstract to you. After a long history of over-exploitation, -ex increasing efforts to restore marine ecosystems and rebuild fisheries are underway. Here we analyze current trends from a fisheries and conservation perspective. In five of 10 well-studied ecosystems, the average exploitation rate has recently declined, yet 63% of assessed fish stocks worldwide still require rebuilding. Even lower exploitation rates are needed to reverse the collapse of vulnerable species. Okay, so you see basically what they're talking about. Um, and again, these are data where we have detailed data because they're commercial fish. So in one of their figures, uh, data sources, um, so in A we, say, we see global catch data. The colors shaded refer to the natural logarithm of the average reported catch from 1950 to 2004. Okay, and obviously they've done some big interpolation. And B, other data, Stock assessments quantify the status of exploited populations. Research trawl surveys are used to estimate fish community trends. Ecosystem models are used to assess responses to fishing. And so you can see different types of, of studies that have been done. Do we see anything familiar? Especially in panel B? No, nothing familiar there? How many points are there off the coast of North America and Europe? And how many points are there across the coast, off the coasts of the developing world? So, the, I'm, I, I'll give you a copy of this paper, but essentially the authors are, are looking at um, different parameters of population models, uh, essentially whether they are in a, in a rebuilding phase or in a declining phase. And you can see the rebuilding ones have uh, tendency that direction and the collapsed ones this direction. Uh, and then I thought this was quite interesting um, so, 
panel A is rebuilding of Kenyan small-scale fisheries through gear restrictions and closed area management. And so you can see, in general, the incomes deriving from that are going upward. Okay, then this was really interesting. Move it, movement of fishing effort from developed nations to Africa in the 1990s. Essentially, as northern fisheries collapsed, what the European nations did was to move their fishing efforts around, uh, around Africa, and those were based on uh, distant water fishing agreements. Okay, it's a really interesting how, how this sort of information can be used to see into you know, social trends, economic trends, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So, this is all about community composition. So it's all about which species are present. And so I wanted to show you one example from my lab. Um, this is a, a working group composed of a whole bunch of students. Um, you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 14 student authors and me and one uh, technician. And this is essentially a group that Aaron participated in a century ago. Um, but, but we work on um, projects of interest to the whole group and we develop kind of big collaborative publications I think the group is at 12 publications now. But essentially, I just want to show you this sequence. The title of the manuscript, which by the way, I think has been rejected five times so far. Decadal scale avifaunal change from museum and observational data for sites across the United States and Canada. So this is essentially something about community composition. Right? How does the list of species change through time? And so we took an ungodly number of data points. And what you can see is in blue are the modern points and in black are the old points. And we wanted to look at change and we wanted to focus on climate change. So old was defined as before 1980. And new was defined as after 2010. So three decades in which we know that climates are, are warming rather rapidly. And we wanted to ask, are there differences? And if there are differences, do they fit with trends that we would anticipate, that we would predict? But this is not an easy proposition because we're, we're melding together data from museums, which are mostly the old data, and observations, which are mostly the new data. And just to give you an idea, the number of observations is approximately a hundredfold greater in the new than in the old. And that's going to cause us all sorts of problems. But this is just the, the total number of, um, or the total distribution of those points. Some of those points would refer to hundreds of records. We took the 28 million, I think it was 28 million, maybe I'm wrong, uh, but a, a large number of occurrence records from before 1980, and we used what are called inventory completeness statistics to establish which sites had been well sampled. Okay, so most of you are familiar with species accumulation curves, where you plot the number of species detected against the amount of effort. Right? And you see the curve go like this. Well, if that curve is flat, that inventory is probably done. If that curve is doing this, that inventory is not done. We taught a whole course on this, so I'm not going to repeat it. It's available to you. I'll point you towards it at the end of, the, of this course. Um, 
there are better statistics than cur fitting curves. There are some nice non-parametric uh, estimators that indicate essentially how complete the inventory is. But just suffice it to say that we took a huge amount of input data, checked every five kilometer pixel across the US and Canada for how complete its inventory was for birds before 1980. And we got 139 sites across the US, southern Canada, and then three sites way north, okay? That's our baseline, okay? When we talk about, you know, having a point of comparison, those are the sites where with the digital accessible knowledge, you remember that term, with the digital accessible knowledge available to us from before 1980, those 139 sites are demonstrably well sampled. Now right away we can see some problems. Look at where the well sampled sites are concentrated. Right where people are concentrated in, uh, in North America, right? You basically go from Chicago and a couple of states farther north and west that aren't very important. Chicago over across into like Pennsylvania and then the eastern seaboard. Erin missed it that I slipped in a Minnesota insult, didn't she? I did miss it. Disappointing. Um, so that's our baseline. But we need, we need a before and after comparison. So then we had to ask, after 2010, which of these 139 sites is demonstrably also well sampled? Now here we have a blessing and a curse. The blessing is we have a hundredfold more information. The curse is that we have a hundredfold more information. Because none of the programs, not R, not um, not Microsoft Access, none of the programs that we used to process tabular information could deal with 80 or 100 million records. Just didn't work. So that's why this guy Ed Comp is involved because he's a computer scientist and he was able to deal with it, um, but it was, you know, it took him a day, which means a, it's a pretty terrible problem. But essentially what we did was we took a 10 kilometer circle around each one of these points. We probed into the open access online data portals for, for uh, occurrence data, pulled out data for each one of these 139 sites, and again assessed completeness, but this time for after 2010. Okay? And so notice that I've got some red X's and those are the, the 21, sorry, 31 sites out of 139 that were not well sampled after. Now in, a, in one sense, this was good for us because these far northern sites, none of them was well sampled after 2010. And so our area of analysis became kind of more compact. Um, but we probably lost more western points than we really would have wanted. Because remember we have a huge concentration of our points here. And those western points, every one of them was kind of important to us. But the points that you see in blue are the points that are well sampled before and after those three decades of climate change. So then, we started looking at the lists of species. And so, we could do just a simple matching comparison. We could ask, how similar is the list before to the list after? And we used a jacquard index. And so where you see dark colors is where the list has changed a lot. And where you see light colors are where the list has changed very little. 
Anybody see a pattern in there? Yes. What's the pattern, Emmanuel? Too much on the east. That's right. There's more stability here and less stability out west. Need to test that. We did. You're correct. You perceived a, a pattern that indeed exists, which is to say there is a significant non-random spatial autocorrelation in the distribution of the high values as opposed to the low values. Now, here's the bad part. This is the part of the curse. We have a hundred times more data after than we have before. So, are we more likely to detect a loss of a species or are we more likely to detect a gain of a species? Nobody's talking. Gain. Thank you. <laughs> That's why he won the t-shirt the last time. It was a t-shirt, right? Okay. Um, it's very likely that if there's a rare species at a site, with a hundredfold more data, you detect it. And with a hundredfold less data, you don't detect it. So what we found was that we had way more gains than losses. So that's the curse side. But the blessing side is we may be most interested in losses from a conservation perspective. And if we detected a species in, in the before sample, and didn't detect it after, in spite of a hundredfold time, a hundredfold more sampling, it's probably lost, right? We're more certain that it's gone. And so here's a view of species lost. And notice that the pattern is reversed. More species lost here, and fewer species lost out west. Again, it's significant. Now, we, we still have to make sense of that, and we're going to come back to that in a moment. Um, we did some, some spatially structured models to try to understand what are the drivers of these two patterns of change. But the thing that I found most interesting was species by species. So we have some species like, this is called greater prairie chicken, and it's endemic to a region kind of like this. Gets into Canada, doesn't get into Mexico, so it's mostly endemic to the US. Um, it's declined massively. We knew that from external sites, external sources. And what we can see from our very controlled analysis is that the three sites out of our 108 well-sampled sites before and after, three of them had the species only in the before sample, and none of those three sites still has the species after. Okay? In fact, in the county where I live, where the University of Kansas is, the species has died out since I moved to the University of Kansas. Okay? But there are other ones. We have a couple of species, loggerhead shrike and Buick's wren, that are showing kind of interesting geographic differences in their patterns of disappearance. So look at loggerhead shrike. Gains are in blue, present in both is in white, and losses are in red. And you can see all the losses are in the northeast. Or in Buick's Wren, most of the losses are in the east. Okay? Now, we don't know what the drivers of those gains and losses are, but they're interesting, and they're regional changes. This is what we were talking about with the, the Living Planet Index, where, you know, one population trend for a species doesn't necessarily tell us about the population status of that species. And here what you can see is massive loss of all the eastern populations and relative stability or even gains in the western populations. And that's left out of those species-wide indices we just looked at. 
And then probably the most interesting thing is we had, I believe, five species that are far northern species. They barely touch into the region where our, where our points could see them. This is called boreal chickadee, okay? And gets that name for a reason. And each of those species had massive patterns of population loss. And so we explore that as essentially a northern species, a high latitude species, retracting from the lower latitude parts of its range. Okay? So, Look at these patterns again. Remember, greater stability, yellow, lower stability, dark, but uh, species lost in dark and fewer species lost in light. So essentially what's happening is gains of species are dominating the Jacquard index, okay? And remember, we don't really want to pay much attention to gains because gains are going to be dominated by better sampling after than before. But we want to ask some questions about why are these patterns the way they are? And so we accumulated some potential driver variables, okay, and those include, let's see if I can remember them, temperature change, mm -hmm. precipitation change, forest loss, forest gain, and I don't remember what that one is. And then these are interactions between forest loss and forest, oh, I, I remember, these are the, the spatial variables because we know that our sampling is structured spatially. Amelie could give that lecture probably much better than I could, but I'm not up to it. So essentially we have spatial variables and then spatial variables interacting with um, with forest loss and forest gain. And all I want you to see is that the black bars represent significant factors in different models that we developed, and we had 10, sorry, 11 equivalent models. And what I want you to see is that this spatial dimension number one is significant essentially in all of them except one, okay? And then the other thing that I want you to see is that the only other factor that is significant is forest loss. Um, and so this is essentially saying that, that uh, those are the drivers that we can see, but it's based on 108 sites and the species that are present or absent at those sites, okay? So essentially we developed a bunch of drivers. We brought in the spatial dimension to try to take into account the structure, the fact that we had more points out in the northeast and fewer in the south and west. Um, and then we looked for, oh, I'm sorry, these triangles indicate uh, also significant even though you can't see it, and that's for precipitation change. And it's intriguing because we did similar analyses in Mexico in years past, and there the only driver that was significant in all of our analyses was temperature change. So, you know, I just put that on my list of things that I want to come back to. So the interesting thing about this is that this is a type of analysis that can be done here, not everywhere, but this idea of having tons of recent observational data is pretty universal. 